Thank you for checking out Powerful Impact, where we interview people who had a powerful impact on the community, music, or the culture at large. I'm Soul Rack. Joining me today is SP and Neb. Today, we have the honor of speaking to a hip hop legend who was part of the iconic hip hop production crew, the Beat Miners. Mr. Walt, first of all, we thank you for joining us. And thank we you. also thank, thank you, you so much. for inspiring us with Powerful Impact. We just appreciate who you are. <laughs> and so, you. And so today we just want to just, you know, talk to you and, and, and give people an opportunity to know about your story and your experiences uh, yeah. and to get and give you a chance to even talk about some of the new things that you're working on. And so I'm just going to start us off with the, the first question uh, just to get us going today. Uh, where are you from originally and how did that shape you as a person? I am from Brooklyn, New York. Um, okay. And uh, it's it's. I don't know, but being in, I, I mean, I know a lot of outsiders don't want to hear this, but, you know, being from Brooklyn, it's... Do tell. It's a different, <laughs> it's a, it's different, it's different. I've traveled a lot, and I've okay. been around the world, and just coming, just being from Brooklyn is a different vibe, and it's, mm -hmm. it's just, we, we just have an outlook on, like, a different outlook on everything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, um... And uh, we try to bring that out musically in our music. Yeah, and, and I do notice that. I mean, you definitely, you know, you, you always see that constant battle, especially when we're talking about New York, you have the different boroughs and their contribution right. and right. so forth. What do you think is the distinction um, as far as artists that come from Brooklyn versus the Bronx and the other boroughs that are in the, uh, in the city? Well... Now you really can't hear it, but back mm -hmm. in the 90s, you like the Brooklyn, I don't want to say swag because that sounds so goddamn corny. No, that's um, cool. That's good. <laughs> Work for me. <laughs> um, the, this, the Brooklyn vibe was different. Like when you heard, even before us, like mm -hmm. when you heard a Kane record and you heard a EPMD record or a, a Karis One record, you felt like it was a different vibe. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, and, and then when we came into the picture, we, we bring a little sound to it, like a darker, grimier sound. Mm -hmm. Whereas, uh, you know, a lot of people, it, was, it wasn't that grimy. Where, and really a lot of people credit us with that sound. Mm -hmm. When really, and I always say this in every interview, like the stuff that we were doing, uh, Q-Tip was doing it way before us, and Pete Rock was mm -hmm. doing it way before us, and Lars Professor was doing it way before us. But we, the equipment that we were using gave it a different vibe, mm -hmm. and that's why ours kind of stood out outside of everybody else's. But they, we got it from them. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, that's really what it was. Okay. Yeah. So, um... How did, the, how did the Beat Miners form? Um, all right, so I used to work in a record store in Jamaica, Queens, mm -hmm. um, Music Factory. I was the manager of the store. And it was me and a friend of mine who, who a matter of fact, he, I think he lives in Texas now. He's in Texas. His name is Everett. And okay. we, we was like doing demos together and stuff like that. And I was thinking of a production name. So I'm writing down names. And then I came across Black Moon Productions. So I was like, oh, I like this as a production. I'm going to keep this as my name, right? Mm -hmm. And then Everett was like, yo, you guys, yo, you guys go hard with finding records, man. You guys like, it's like you guys are mining for beats. You're beat miners. And when he said that, you know, you ever seen on TV, the light bulb just comes up and Mm -hmm. yes. It just clicked. Boom. I said, oh, <laughs> Beat Miners. I like that name. Yeah, I'm going to go with that, right? So I scrapped Black Moon Production. So my brother, Evil, he was like, yo, what are you going to do with Black Moon? I was like, yeah, I don't want it. I'm, I'm going to change the name to Beat Miners. He said, yo, let me have that name. I said, sure, go right ahead. And that's where Black Moon comes from. It comes from us not wanting the name no more and, you know, taking Beat Miners. I mean, all beat miners is just us representing what we do. We we go looking for beats mm -hmm. to be more obscure than 
you know, the people who we uh, uh, admire and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. What what's the most obscure beat you use? That we use? Mm-hmm. All uh, right, some of them. All right, the most obscure stuff that we I I can't mention because. It, I want it to still be obscure. <laughs> well, absolutely. <laughs> but, For sure. Um, uh, wow. It would usually be like a, a jazz record or an R&B record that very few have in their collection. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. I think the record I used for Tight was obscure. Well, for Rod Digger. Okay. Mm-hmm. I think uh-huh. that was an obscure record because a lot of people didn't yeah. have that record. Uh, and, and that's what we used to do. Like in the 90s, we were all big on going to buy records together. Like they, they had conventions out here okay. that we would all go to and just buy records. Um, and then outside of that, we would go record shopping. Like record shopping to me, to this day, is still big. I'm just having a discussion with you about that. Like Mm-hmm. Rec- to, I'm 53 and I'm still buying records like that is one of my main things. Mm-hmm. So we usually go shopping with each other or or it'll just be on a, a, a trip by ourselves. But we would go try to find the rarest record and try to we would always try to outdo each other. Us beat nuts, digging in mm-hmm. the crate. Oh, yeah. 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 Mm-hmm. We were all we were all friends. All of us were friends and we still are friends. Mm hmm. But when it came down to putting a record out, buying records and putting records out and, and you know, we would always one up each other. Mm-hmm. But what that would do, was that would inspire the other people to, yo, I got to make my beats better. Mm-hmm. I remember because where we were in D&D, we were in one room and DJ Premier was in the other room. And Premier oh, wow. would always, oh. we would hear stuff and... Primo will always make us step our game up. Because mm-hmm. I'm like, damn. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I got to go yeah. back to the room. Like when I heard kicking the door, when he was making mm-hmm. kicking the door, right? I was like, what? I'm doing something wrong. And I ran to the other room. <laughs> I think I, I made Warzone for mm-hmm. Black Moon. and Okay. Like we would we would push each other. To this day, me and Prem, we will push each other to be like, yo, here, listen to this. Yo, listen to this. Bye, bye, bye. You know? Mm-hmm. I have posted something like that on Instagram a few years ago. Like, what's missing in the game mm-hmm. is friendly competition. Like, we all loved each other. Like, I would, when I was doing Into the Stage, daytime, I would go to the studio with Q-Tip and they're recording Midnight Marauders, mm-hmm. right? Or then I would go to the studio and Premier's recording Hard to Earn. Mm-hmm. So... That would give us like inspiration to go in and make into the stage. Mm-hmm. So if we all lived off each other, and it's missed now because a lot of us we have home studios and mm-hmm. everybody lives in different. Like no, really, nobody's in New York no more. Everybody's spread out, so it's kind of you know it's kind of hard now. Yeah, and I think, and I, and I definitely think friendly competition is always key. Um, it's needed when, in everything. It's yeah. needed in everything. What drove yeah. what drove Michael Jordan uh, Michael Jordan to get those six rings? You know what drove mm-hmm. him? This friendly competition with Charles Barkley, friendly competition with um Patrick Ewing. You know what mm-hmm. I'm saying? Like these they drove him to yo, know, I gotta be he, that's my man, but mm-hmm. I gotta be better than him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's the way it was with us in in the music thing. Yeah, I, I think that made us better. I, I think, you right. know, like, you know, back in the days, you know, especially during the golden era of hip hop, you know, when you had the battles and stuff. I mean, we've seen, a, a, you know, something, I would say, through verses to right. a certain extent. But, right. you know, that made MCs better MCs. It made, like you was talking about you and how you and Primo would, you know, you hear a beat from him, you inspired, oh, let me, let me outdo him. And right. it was friendly competition, but it made us better as artists and i think right. that's something that we need to see more so of versus people were striving to be different they weren't okay well i'm gonna do what he's doing because that's successful they were striving to have their own level of creativity and that's what i liked about what you said you was like okay he, that's dope but let right. me try to one-up him you know what i'm saying and it was just friendly competition it was a beautiful mm-hmm. thing 
but it was part of the creative process. But at the you know, but the end result of that was it made hip hop better. Exactly. You yeah. know what I'm saying? Like exactly. I think I don't know what's the new process with a lot of the younger, mm-hmm. you know, the younger generation. I don't know what their process is. Mm-hmm. I know our process was, yo, I'm in studio today, come by. Oh, okay. You know what I'm saying? And we would go by in the studio, vibe out. Man, I would tell you stories. I remember going in a Midnight Marauder session, Mm -hmm. right? And I walk in and they're working on the song Midnight, right? Okay. I first meet Raphael Sadiq. So Raphael Sadiq is in there and he's playing bass on the song. So So then I'm like, oh, wow. Like I'm in awe, right? So he says, yo, listen to this new artist that I got that I'm telling this, this artist I think is going to blow everybody away. So I'm like, okay, sure. He pops to the, the, I got back then. I think it was a dat maybe. It was a dat. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think so, dat. Yeah, right, that, I think it was a dat tape. That, mm-hmm. He plays this artist. He said, yeah, his name is D'Angelo. Oh, wow. And he wow. played Brown Sugar for me. And I was like, yo, this is amazing. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And so mm-hmm. I leave there to go back to D&D where I record that, where me and Premier record that, mm-hmm. and I'm inspired. So I'm, I'm making how many MCs, I'm making I Got You Open, blah, 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 just by getting vibe, getting good vibes off of Raphael and Q-Tip. That's crazy. Wow. Yeah. And see, wow. and, and you know, you just told an, um, you know, a story we wouldn't have heard um, right, right, right. About D'Angelo because, you know, who were, uh, I mean, he became what he said he was. He yeah. saw that a long time ago. He was able to experience that. But Raphael, so, yeah, Raphael yeah. and Ali is the one who put him on. Mm-hmm. Yep. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yep. And then so, I turned around and I did the remix with Brown Sugar. Oh. Oh, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I, mean, <laughs> I mean, you know, did some historic things and I'm sure Thank there's more to come, you. but I mean, you did some, you know, some legendary um, tracks already that we know, but I didn't even know about the Brown Sugar remix. See, so. you know what happened? Um, mm-hmm. I think it could be two things. It could be Kadar Masterberg, I, I, like he was the manager at the time. Okay, we just didn't see eye to eye, and he could have been petty and just like, yeah, you know what? I'm not putting it out. Or our our thing had a sample in it. I think they couldn't get the sample clear. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So you know, but it's like. One of the obscure, it's like very obscure now. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's funny how we're talking about obscure records. That's one of the obscure records now. Like it's very hard to find because I think they couldn't get the sample clear, but EMI put the record out. Mm-hmm. But they had to take it off the shelf because they couldn't get the sample clear. Okay. So, okay, so we now did. Now I gotta find it. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, so we did so get that. Dig in the crates and find it. <laughs> yeah. So we did get one that was obscure because at first he was reluctant, but we got it out of you anyway, Mr. White. Right, right, <laughs> right, just, right, just, right. I think fun you can with... find it on YouTube. You can find okay. uh, 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 the music on YouTube, but the actual pressing is hard to find. Okay. Right. All right. Well, we now we're gonna be on a now we're gonna be on a scavenger hunt to find. I mean, I can send it. I'll, I'll send it to y'all. If you... Oh yeah, definitely. Most oh, definitely. SP, oh. SP, let me get email. Like, I'll send it to SP and SP. You can send it to everybody. And... All right. Okay. Cool. That'd yeah. be dope. That's dope. Yeah. So, uh, initially, how did Black Moon form? They all went to high school together. I'm the mm-hmm. I'm. Out of everybody in, in Black Moon and Boot Camp, I'm the oldest. So I oh, would, okay. I'm like three, four years older than they are. So they all went to high school together. At least 5FT and Evil D went to high school. They went to Bushwick High School. And um, I know um, they met Buckshot later because Buckshot and 5FT are Muslim. So they, mm-hmm. they met at the mosque. They used to go to this mosque on Bushwick Avenue okay. where um, J- um, Jazzo, um, he used to go and Jay-Z used to go to and stuff like that. They would go there. So this... Uh... Now, Jay-Z's not Muslim. I just want to say that. He's not Muslim. He just <laughs> used to be with Jazz over there. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no <laughs> doubt. No doubt. <laughs> For sure. For sure. Yeah, I don't. Want, I, I know you're like, wait a minute. I ain't see 
Jay Z with a kufi on. What's going well, well, on? <laughs> well we, we appreciate you giving us that disclaimer, but it's okay. <laughs> Actually, I did see Jay Z wearing one on when? the second on um that second album. What's the album? Right, in my right, lifetime, right, 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 when right. he's praying to Biggie. So right, when you just said right, that, right, that's the right. picture I got in my head. Like, wait a minute, right. that's what he, he had to kufi dust that kufi off. But, that's what but, I'm talking about. Nah, he's not Muslim, but he. Well, so you know he he jazz is a big um big big uh inspiration to him. Yes, he and he used to mm-hmm. always like be on the jazz and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And they and jazz was Muslim, and they used to go to the mosque on Bushwick Avenue. And, I and I, you can kind of hear the inspiration the inspiration from that in his music now. I see um, in his in these last few albums that. Well, right. actually, him and Beyonce are starting to incorporate some of the religious aspects of their right. heritage, and mm-hmm. I'm loving seeing that. Right, 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 right. Beyonce's not making pop records no more. She's making black music. Yes, yeah. yeah. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. And, and yeah, I, I, I don't okay. think white Americans too happy about that, but hey, we y'all can't have everything. They'll be <laughs> all right. They'll be all right. They'll be all right, <laughs> right. right. Y'all got... Y'all got Ariana Grande. Y'all good. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I got Adele and Ariana I Grande. I was the Y'all only good. one who, who noticed that the difference in the sound and the drum right. that right, she's right, using right. and the the visuals that she's mm-hmm. using are iconic. Right. Um, African spirituality. Right. Um, images. So. I'm glad you you mentioned that because I also picked that up in Jay Z's music in his right. later music. So right. yeah, that's right. dope. Especially right. with Jay Electronica, that last album with Jay Electronica. Yeah, and they got all type of writing on there and all of right. that stuff, like right. real, right, right. So if why are you not a part of Black Moon? I'm just that's like I was saying earlier. I like to be. The, I'm the back background guy. I'm not the upfront guy. I'm I'm the I'm the I'm the spoon that stirs the pot. That's me. You know what I'm saying? I'm the spoon. I'm that's... stealing that one, Mister Walt. I'm stealing that. <laughs> that's going by my new one. My new one is I'm the spoon that I'm stirs the, spoon the pot. That stirs the pot, right? Like, and I don't do emails. Those are the two <laughs> things. I'm a spoon holder and no emails for me. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just, I'm just the uh, um. So rack, you muted. Oh, I'm sorry about that. I say, don't try to use Mr. Walt to validate your claim. <laughs> we, we, we see you. We right here. We right here. I'm the pot stirrer. I love it. Thank you, Mr. Walt. I'm <laughs> running with that throughout well, next year. Yeah, with yeah that. that's me. I'm the OG. I love, I love it. everybody. Yo, I'm give the me OG. a T-shirt for Christmas, so rack. <laughs> hey, it's all good. Hey, you know what? You know we what? call him the man behind the blue wall. Yeah, yes, but me. now, but now I'm the pot stirrer officially. I'm the pot. Yeah, you know right, what? right. It don't matter. It don't matter what tool you use to stir the pot, as long as it's stirred. That's all. Right. That exactly. That day, exactly. You know? That's what it all matters at the end of the day. So I'm gonna ask you um, a personal question, and we kind of touched about well, slightly because we asked why you didn't uh, become a part of Black Moon. But what was it like working with your brother? Because that's a unique dynamic on its own. What was it like having that experience working with your brother for all of these years, producing and the different? Uh, I mean, mm-hmm. I listen. I love working with my brother because even though we're two different producers, we have we we have the same vision. Mm-hmm. And when I don't see something, he would go, "Yo, let's do this." And if he pr- does something, I go, "Yo, you know what I'm hearing on this?" And blah blah blah, and he follows it. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I couldn't be partnered up with anybody except for him okay. like we complement each other and we do everything together musically so like uh i mean you know all we're doing really is just we, we make this is what our mothers want our, our mother wanted like she wanted her two sons to, to work together and we've been working together for the almost 30 30 years we've been making records the chemistry is there like and it's always yeah. been there it's always been there. And it's no denying it either. It's definitely yeah, we're doing this for our mom. Um, you know, our mom's up in heaven, in heaven, and we're doing it for her. Makes you rest in power, but yeah. Thank you, thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So do you think that Black Moon and, and um, 
boot camp click um, either separately or collectively get the recognition they deserve? No, they don't. But as you get older, if you if the right people know, that makes mm -hmm. you happy. You know what I'm saying? Like I always say this, like when Dre and Snoop had the hip hop on lock, Black Moon and, and Wu Tang bring mm -hmm. it back to the East Coast. We set it mm -hmm. up for Mob Deep and Biggie and mm -hmm. Nas to take the helm. You know what I'm saying? But mm -hmm. yeah. I agree. When Dre and Snoop was on top of the world, then all of a sudden, who got the props and protect your neck came out. Yep. And that bring it back over here to, to the East Coast. And then, like I said, that set it up for everybody else to sing. But no one mentions that. Everybody gives it to, I mean, get, right, rightfully so, definitely give it to Wu-Tang. But they gave it to Biggie. Biggie came after us. Nas mm -hmm. came after mm -hmm. us. Mob Deep, Mob Deep came out before us, but they didn't really hit notoriety until after us. Mm -hmm. So it was, you know, I just felt like they was giving the credit to the wrong people. Mm -hmm. Right. And I'm yeah. not I'm not one to boast about stuff and stuff like that. But that right there, that's you should give that to us because we're the ones who kind of set it off that way. Nev, you have a question? Yes, Mr. Walt. Not yes, to like nitpick here, but I just want to know, is that 92 or 93 those two singles come out? With the winter of 92. They right. came out exactly around the same time. Yes, that's right. Okay. So the chronic, the chronic is already on top of the world, right? Mm -hmm. The chronic yeah. came out. The chronic came out like '92, like around that time. But but he was already on top with Deep Cover. He was already mm -hmm. on top with nothing but a yeah. weak thing. Mm -hmm. So the album came out in December, and it just blew him out of like into a different stratosphere. But yeah. We we came out with who got the props and protect your neck at the same time, mm -hmm. and it, all it did was bring it back to the East Coast. And, and when who got the props came out mm -hmm. in Texas, we were like, "What is that?" What <laughs> right, is that? Florida too, Florida too. We that same thing for real. Yeah. Oh yeah, wow. no doubt. Oh, that boom, kid, boom. Where you where you at now? Where are you at? I'm in New York, man. New oh, York. he's oh, he's with me. Yeah, he with Definitely, you. Yeah, I'm over here, man. Queens, baby, Queens. Now. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Look at it. He re he represented well too. Queens, Queens. You said. Right. <laughs> <laughs> what part of Queens? Uh, Rochdale. Oh, my son Roach. lives in Rochdale. Yeah. Oh shoot, get out yeah. of here. But, <laughs> I but mean, I'm he's away at college now. But when he's back here, he's he's in Rochdale. He's, he's, he stays with his grandmother. Dope. Yeah. What? Those, mm -hmm. In Texas, those bass lines and those songs would shake the whole house when we turned mm -hmm. and we turned those speakers on. And there is nothing like y'all's bass lines. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It yeah. started out, we were really like trying to make like trying to come up with the most creative bass lines. Like we would of course, we would look for these bass lines and records. And then if we if they weren't there, we would chop them so they could sound like that. But then as our production grew, it was like more about, you know, make sure that snare, that snare is smacking so mm -hmm. they could like you know, pierce their ears and stuff like that, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. I get all that. I get all that from when I well, um I get all, all that from Q tip, like hair and his stuff. Okay. Yeah, I get all that mm -hmm. from Q -tip. You know, speaking of, you know speaking I love sound. that you give Q-Tip props. I think Q-Tip is one of the most underrated. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, and I love that you give you giving him props because I think um, he deserves a lot more props right. than than well, he gets. Even though I'm older than all of them, he's the one who number one he gave me the name Mr. Walt. Okay. Oh yeah, and, and and low end theory. What's music factory without Mr. Walt? That was me. Okay, right. And he taught me how to use the SP12. Oh wow! I mean, wow, we a... all of us we all learn from a large professor somehow, some way. Mm -hmm. Large professor taught, taught Q-tip, and Q-tip in turn around and taught me. But large taught a lot of us. A me, Premier, all mm -hmm. of us 
how to use the SB12. So, you know, but I owe a lot to q -tip. So what about the reggae sounds in your production? That just comes from, I love reggae. My, I'm, my, my family is Caribbean based. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, I just I reggae and hip hop to me is just goes hand in hand. I agree. If it's done yeah. correctly, if it's not mm -hmm. done correctly, it's why. Why do you say yeah. that, Mister Walt? Why do you say that? Because not even gonna. I'm not even gonna use the whole cool Herc and he's from Jamaica and Jamaica toasting and blah blah blah. It's just boom, boom, boom. right. You know what I'm but you know what I'm saying. But mm -hmm. it's just like the old Yellow Man records and 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 the mm -hmm. Andrew Bailey records. It, it was bass first. And yeah. the way they would the way they would get on the mic and just be doing their song, like Super Cat, the way Super Cat, Super Cat. Oh man, he was a beast. He's incredible. Like you know, oh, and on some MC shit. That's yeah, right. yeah, he so, dope. Right. So what'd you say about the MC stuff? Say it again. He's like it's 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 like it a rapping toaster. Okay. Huh? You mean like he's like a rapping type of DJ? You mean like a rapping? Yes, type I of... I like, yeah, like okay. a selector. Gotcha. Like, mm -hmm. Gotcha. He was mm -hmm. like him. Like that's that's my shit. Like the Yellow Man and mm -hmm. like I said, Super Cat and like the way they get on that mic. First of all, they get on the mic and they hold the mic a certain type of way, and they're standing a certain type of way. Like I'm the most incredible person you see on this stage right here. Like all mm -hmm. the swagger, like the Slick Rick swagger and all mm -hmm. that. That comes from Super Cat and and uh, and Admiral Bailey and Josie Wells and and mm -hmm. Jacob Miller. The way these people would get on the mic and just hold a mic. Even Bob Marley. Look how Bob Marley was like was on that mic. Like that's where that yeah. comes from. It comes from that. I miss that swagger. Yeah, you're not getting that now. Like because no one's gonna take the time out to do the research. People nowadays just. Well, they just feel like they pick up a mic, they mm -hmm. rhyme cat with hat, and they are MC. Mm -hmm. That's true. There's no doing the research. There's no going back and, and looking who came before you. It's none of that. That's true. I, I miss that. I miss that swagger. I miss that um, friendly competition. Right, right. Where right. people get on the mic like, oh, you freestyling? Oh, you not freestyling. If right. I'm not freestyling, you know. Right, right. Yeah. Really, I, I know. I, and and the crazy I miss thing that. Is, right, but the, the crazy thing is, uh, we were talking earlier. Jada Kiss bring that back in the versus thing, like yeah, versus the yes. straight. Yeah. But Jada, when Jada got up there and just changed the game, and now everybody freestyling. Look, yo, look at those. We all knew KRS One had a bigger catalog than Kane. That's true. Mm -hmm. But let me tell you this something. When Kane did those freestyles, mm -hmm. Kane tapped that. I love Chris. Chris is my brother, and I love him. But Kane tapped that ass a little bit. Yeah. Kane. Oh Kane yeah. Did some shit. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he brought it. <laughs> yeah. His, his, his whole presence was Yo. Kane, and you Kane, didn't. Come on. When he said yeah. to him, when he said to him. Yo, uh, thank. Oh, by the way, uh, I didn't say nothing when you and Shan had got said thank you when he said yeah, that. that Come on, yeah, that was yeah. <laughs> he got him on that one. He knew it too. <laughs> Yo, that was different right there. So you know, yeah, it's especially that, with um, Kane Swagger. I kept telling people that Kane Swagger is kind of unbeatable. Right, it's something right. about Kane. Right. You know, KRS One is a rapper's rapper. Oh yeah, he's, he's a Karis one is a beast. He he yeah. he yeah. is old, he's always in beast, beast. mode. Yeah, he, he, is. he is. He is. He is. But Kane, the swagger in Kane, right? And and not lacking the skill, right? But he also brings that something extra that was going to be, right. you know, hard to beat. You know, right. right? Well, you even noticed that when Kane was like. Speeding up with the with the rhymes, and right. he went faster. Karis one didn't even touch that. He was like, "Yo, you know what I'm saying?" He yeah, blew. but Karis, Karis one never really made a record that that fast. Exactly. Yeah, and he never, knew it. Yeah, like yeah. his fastest record might be "You Must Learn" or something like that. I think so. Oh, yeah. yeah, you must I learn. So. Be yeah, that, yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you're definitely right on that. You're right. That's true. That, yeah, that, that up tempo style. What you saying, SP? 
I said, Kane came in with a strategy because right, I, I right, right, he right, had right. to know his catalog wasn't going to measure up to KRS ones. Just right, right. Right. But Kane being Kane is all he needed. Right, 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 right. That's all he ever needed. He, right. Even even when he was at his highest, right. it was because it was Cain being Cain, and we love that. Right, exactly, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, and I, and I want to ask you something about your creative process, because being that you're a producer, you know, we don't always don't get the opportunity to talk to a producer as far as, you know, what their thought process when they begin to make music. And I know you don't you don't have to get too deep because I know you got to keep your secrets to yourself. But as far as uh, when you make a beat, do you usually do you usually start with the drum first or loop first? What, how do you normally approach a, a record or a track when you begin to produce the track? I usually most of the time is 90 percent of the time is loop first. Mm hmm. It's the music first. And then once I establish that, because that's my foundation, then I'm like, okay, what drums or what drum pattern should I use for this song? Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And then everything just falls into place after that. But it's usually loop first. Okay. Yeah. So uh, out of all the songs that you've produced, oh, I'm going to, this question always gets people because- oh, And it's going to get me too. too. It's going to get me. <laughs> All of them are your babies. <laughs> um, so they what's your favorite song, your right. favorite song that you produce? They all are, like, I love them all. But for a long time, like, the most favorite, my most favorite song was Bucktown USA. Okay. From mm -hmm. But every once in a while, I don't really listen to my stuff like that, but if they come up like on Spotify or YouTube or whatever, and if I got it on, first of all, I'm, I always block out that I made the song and I'm like, wow, what the, what the hell is this? Like, oh, I forgot <laughs> about this song. And <laughs> it, 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 it always gives me a good vibe and stuff like that, but I'm proud of all of them. Mm -hmm. I'm proud of all of them. Yeah, I noticed that there was a, a change in the sound from the Black Moon into the stage album to the most recent Rise of the Moon. Right. Was there was that strategically done, or that was just a matter of growth? Or just... I mean, growth. It's really. Okay. It, it, I mean, look, it, when we did when we did into the stage, right? Mm -hmm. We were a bunch of kids um, who did, we I didn't have we didn't have no equipment. We had like bullshit equipment. We didn't have. <laughs> the SPs and the nine foot, like we had like a, a Kai 612 mm -hmm. and this this sampler doesn't even read MIDI. It's, and it, it samples for like, like three seconds or maybe, I don't know. Okay. And so we had to put things on 45 and so we had that and we were triggering it with a SK100, a Casio SK100. Okay. So we would take it, put all our sounds and loops on a cassette. Not a dad tape, a cassette tape. Mm -hmm. Take it to the studio. Tell our engineer, Swift, his name was Swift. He was our engineer. Hey, Swift, take this, loop this, take this, put this on top of this. Blah, blah, blah. We did that for every song. Like we, we, did the, the, we had the ideas in our head, right? Mm -hmm. So we did the whole album like that, right? Okay. So we we I had an RZ one too, a Casio RZ one too, but it's still the sample time wasn't a lot. Okay. Um, we took the money that we made from Into the Stage and bought our equipment, and that made us make the shine. And so Into the Stage was all stuff from our mind. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The shining was actually us actually okay. Let's do that. We're actually programming the drums and we're actually putting the loop. We're doing it ourselves. Like, Swift, we don't need you to do that anymore. Now we can do it. Mm -hmm. and, then, and plus we had a chip on our shoulder too, on our shoulder too, because Black Moon's album sounded a certain way. It sounded muddy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We thought when we were mixing the record, we thought 
we didn't think about nobody with Walkmans. We didn't think about nobody with home stereos. We all we thought everyone in the world had a Jeep, and we was going to make <laughs> music for your yeah. Jeep. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Our, you made music for mine. Right, yeah. right. So that was us. That was our mentality. So I remember going down to Greek Fest, and uh, in Philly. And uh, so we was listening to Sally Got a One Track Mind mm -hmm. in the car and hearing how Diamond made that bass line sound like that. I was like, yo, E, this is what we got to do. We got to do it like this. <laughs> so that was our mentality. And when we would mix the records, we would mix them in big speakers. You're not supposed to mix in big speakers, but we didn't know that. We mm -hmm. were just young kids. So we're mixing everything. It sound bassy. When we get to mastering or... or when we get the record back from mastering, we're like, yo, this doesn't sound right. But everyone's loving the sound. Mm -hmm. So we're like, this is too bassy, blah, blah, blah. We put too much bass into it. So when we, and also we recorded into the stage from 12 midnight to 6, p to 6 a.m., right? So when we got the budget for The Shining and we got the green light to go, I had a meeting with the guys and I said, all right, I'm going to tell y'all right now, we are now recording your album, The Shining. We're going to record that 12 o'clock noon. Everybody was upset with me. Oh, what the hell are you talking about? <laughs> blah, blah, blah. I said, yo, trust me. It, at 12 o'clock noon, our ears are less muddy. Mm -hmm. You have to understand, when we get into the stage, we would hang out. I'm going to hang out with this guy. We're hanging out with that guy before we went to the studio. And then when I'm in when I'm in the studio, my ears got a whole bunch of stuff going on. I'm not really hearing the music clear. Mm -hmm. Whereas 12, 12 o'clock noontime, my ears are fresh. I just woke up like a few hours earlier. You know, I'm ready to go and everything sounds clearer. That's why to me, the shining, I can listen to the shining to this day. I barely listen to Into the Stage. Not because Into the Stage was whack, or it's just. The Shining to me was like a step up and it was like our, we got a, a um, we got something to prove record. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, The Shining to me was that. And then as we, we went, as we came to this, to this day, everything sounds different because we're still growing mm -hmm. and, you know, technology and stuff like that. My brother in the beat monitors, my brother is the, he's the equipment guy. He's the tech guy. He's the nerd when it comes down to all the plugins and blah 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 like me i'm the record guy i'm the yo such as i played bass on this song and such as i produced this record and blah 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 all i need is a beat machine and some records and i'm mm -hmm. good evil oh yo he wants yo give me this type of program give me this type of this that i'm like oh, i don't care about all that shit. just give me a beat machine and a record i'm good so, so you like me, BC before computer. That's right, that's me. <laughs> I, yo, I use I like anything that I have. I'm I'm using it out of necessity. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. Serato on my laptop, and like I said, computers, Pro Tools in my computer. I'm, that's out of necessity. That mm -hmm. to me, everything else, yo, E can take care of that. Like E's a he's a nerd when it comes down to that. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, um. I, I'm going to hit you with another one of those questions. No problem. <laughs> so what's your favorite album or group you produce or both? Oh, wow. Uh, wow. <laughs> All right. Favorite album is going to be The Shining. That's okay. always going to be my favorite album. Um, and The Shining... It, it had it, 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 it hiccups because me and Tech, we did not see eye to eye on that album. And, mm -hmm. and the crazy shit about that is I'm June 2nd, Tech is June 3rd. Oh, okay. But we were rah, rah, through that whole record. <laughs> through that whole record, we was going at each other. But, you know, but at the end result, it was, it was a great record. So the artist wise, I, I, I mean, I, I I love them all. I mean, I that I can't pick. Artist wise, I can't pick. Mm -hmm. But but um um album wise is the shining. Can I ask Mr. Walt, why did you and Tech 
have beef over what? Like songs, samples? What was the tech was an asshole. That's why. Oh. <laughs> he made it clear. <laughs> okay. I thought it was Tell because him. of some, I thought it was because of some, you know, creative differences or whatever. It's a, it a little bit of everything, but tech tech is tech was an asshole. He was an asshole. <laughs> Allegedly. Tell, right. us you, so tell us how you really feel, Mr. Walt. Yes, you're right. I'm sugar coated. Yeah, I like the song of him in, I and, like and I'm, I'm, I'm a, But here's the crazy shit. If you ask mm-hmm. Tech, like if you interview Tech, he'll say mm-hmm. Mr. Walt was an asshole. So He's I guess we were asshole to the each other. The feelings mutual. Oh, well, yeah. Right, 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 right. Well, we, Can, we, Mm-hmm. Don't go, go so right. Sorry. No, I'm just saying we got your side of the story. So right. we, we got yeah, when tech side. comes on, we'll ask it the same yeah. exact <laughs> thing. Yeah, Mr. Like, who, him, Mr. Sure. I don't even want to talk right. about that right now. You do it now. You do it. Um Mr. Hey, well, you know, I, I mean, at the end of the day, that's that's my uh production family, that's my recording family, and brother and brothers course. fight. So you know, that's yeah, how we've known each other for decades. Right, know? right. We'll, we'll right. go back from an idea we need. We'll come up right. from a long time. I want to ask <laughs> right, real right, quick, what right. uh, what island is your family from? And then I my, have another question. My family is from Belize. Boom. Oh, All right. Okay. That's my what's up. From Belize. Right. All right. Uh, so that was one before when you, uh, when you said that. I was like, I wanted to ask, but we were moving so fast. Now, right. my question is this. Now, not to compare anybody, but when it comes to like a person like the RZA, because the Wu-Tang's right, saga is out now. Right. And he has his method of like, all right, these tracks are for blah, blah, blah. These right. beats are for da, da, da. Or y'all got to go fight for these tracks here. Whoever got the best verse. How did you decide with or his whole crew, besides record labels, how do you decide, you know, this track is for you, this is for that album, blah, blah, blah. blah. Like, how was that process? Because there's a lot of heads in that kitchen stirring that pot. You're talking about mostly boot camp, right? Yeah. All right, so what we would do is when it's someone's time to step up, like when it's someone's time to to have to work on their project, that's what we're making the project for. So, of course, when Into the Stage, it was all about Black Moon. We wasn't thinking about Tech and Steel yet. You know what I'm saying? So when we finished Into the Stage, we would do B-sides, but mainly into the stage was over. So now it's, okay, now it's tech and steel time. So when we do tech and steel and then tech and steel is over, now it's Sean Price and Rock's time, Helter Skelter time. And then that's how the process went. But one thing I will say though, we did step out every once in a while because Soundboy Burial, I made Mm -hmm. that with Helter Skelter. But I made that pre- Pre uh, the reggae the intro and all that it was just mm-hmm. the beat and the bass line. And I played it for Sean. And Sean was like, oh, I don't want this shit. That shit is whack. Ba 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 ba, right? And mm-hmm. Tech overheard him. And Tech said, What? You don't want that? He said, Nah, I don't want that. I don't want this. He said, Yo, I'll take it. And then when Tech took it, it kind of opened me up to be like, oh, Okay, wait a minute. So that's when I added the. Uh, um, la, 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 la. I added all that after that. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So yeah. I made that originally for Helter Skelter, but they took okay. it. And it worked too. That was the last song we did on The Shining. Mm-hmm. Yep. So I, you obviously know you had an impact on us. Thank you. Just the name of the podcast can right. tell you that much. <laughs> right, right. So, uh, what was it like making that song? Because that song, what power shout, power out to, shout out to Buster, that song hit the, the bass. There's nothing like that song in your car. Right, with, right. I'm still old school with the Alpines right. in the right. back. And, right. it, and that, boom. Right. That, is fire. So well, what was it like making that song? That song, I'm not even gonna like take the credit for that song. That was the Evil D. Evil D put that together. That was a part of their demo. Mm-hmm. And I remember when he was making it, he was, um, he made it down, cause the equipment was downstairs in my apartment. So he was down there and I remember how he put it together. And the way he used to do things, it was, 
it was next level. One thing about my brother, my brother is a genius. Like mm -hmm. the way he put samples together, it's like I didn't even think about doing it that way. But he would cut the hemp sample in half and then stretch it and turn it, uh, slow it down so it gave it a different vibe. But when he put the buster in there, it just made it, it just took it to a different level. But that was all Evil D. Evil D, he did that. Oh, wow. I was just sitting back like, wow, what's going on here? Yeah, he did that. The, the, we always uh, we always put uh, um produced by the beat miners. Mm -hmm. But we it's either I did it or he did it, but we come in as a group because that's how we are. That's how we came into the game. We came in as this is us two, we, you know, and we're presenting our music to you. You can sit there mm -hmm. and try to decipher all right, which one E made and which one Walt made, but <laughs> Everything we do, we split down the middle. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's dope. Yep. Thank you. Yeah, that's a wonderful dynamic, especially working with, you know, your family and right. things of that nature. Right. You right. you know, right. you, you prove to people that you can work with your brother or your sibling right. and do something great and still get along, even though you're working right. together. So you guys prove that. So that's a wonderful thing within itself. Right. I want to I want to continue to stay on the uh, conversation we're having about production because you can give us some insight that okay. we wouldn't get from a MC because you're a producer. So <coughs> okay. producer. yeah, definitely, definitely tap into that. So who were some? I, I know you did mention Q Tip earlier, but I just want to give you a chance to expound on your early influences coming up in terms of production that help you find your signature sound and style. Man, uh, um. Bomb Squad, yo. But no, it takes a nation okay. of millions. Mm -hmm. Changed my life. It changed like I was in. I was in. Uh, I was working in a record store in Queens. I was working okay. at Music Factory on 165th Street in Jamaica, mm -hmm. right? And I was dibbling and dabbling in production. I did it, but I didn't really take it seriously. I thought I was going to be a DJ for the rest of my life, which I I am, but. Mm. I didn't even think about produ pr like make taking production seriously. So mm. me working at that record store, I, a friend, I made friends with a lot of people in the game. And that's where I met Q-Tip. That's where I met uh, God Rest the Dead. Today's is Anna Rick, Jam Master J. I met LL. They, everybody used to come to my store, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I was good. I was real tight with Delight from Steph Sonic. So... I didn't really vibe with Public Enemy in the beginning. I thought they were cool, mm -hmm. right? But when I heard Rebel, like everything was cool, but when I heard Rebel without a pause, I was like, wait a minute, what's this? This is incredible, Ooh. right? So it was like a setup to me. So first I heard Rebel, then I'm like, okay, yo, this is this is different, this is dope. Mm -hmm. Then I heard Bring the Noise. Then I said, oh, wait a minute. Like yeah. I'm getting excited, yeah. right? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean. Excited. So one day Delight comes into the store and says, yo, and, and this, back then, we would get everybody's album before it came mm -hmm. out. Like that was a big thing with, with everybody, like to have someone's record before it comes out so you could hear it and preview it before it actually hits the street. That was really big, right? Yes. So Delight walks in, Delight walks into the store and he, he says, yo, Walt, you got to hear this. And I said, what is it? He said, trust me, I'm not even going to tell you what it is. And gives me an all black cassette. Right? Mm -hmm. I pop it in and I hear London, England. Uh, I'm like, yo, what the? <laughs> oh, shit. And, and then, <laughs> but then Bring the Noise is the first record. So I'm like, oh, mm -hmm. oh, this is, what is this? And then it goes into Don't Believe the Hype. And then mm -hmm. it goes into Cold Lamping. And then I'm like, yo, this P.E. second album? And he was like, yeah. And I listened to that album front and back. And it, yo, it changed my mind. And it said, and it just made me go, this is what I want to do. I mm -hmm. want to do production. And then right there is when I locked in what I wanted. When I heard that album. Yo, every anniversary for It Takes a Nation of Millions, I will get on. Instagram and I would at Chuck and at Hank and Keith Shockley. Yo, if it wasn't for you, I would not be here. I would not be who I am. I would run into Hank Shockley and and uh, uh, I once ran into Chuck in LA and I was mm -hmm. like, yo, you don't know what you did for me. 
That record changed. Like, mm-hmm. that's my favorite album of in any genre. You could say, what's your favorite country album? I say, it takes a nation of millions to hold us back. Public mm-hmm. enemy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so that to me is the greatest <laughs> record ever, ever. Mm-hmm. That record changed my life. It, it so, changed a lot of lives. Yeah. I know I, know I, I was probably the only uh, person in, in Texas that was clamoring for Dashi Guiana. <laughs> <laughs> What was, what was the scene in Texas like back then? Like this is eighty eight. So what was the scene back then? Back then, well, actually, because most of the music that we got, because we didn't have like a big hip hop station or anything like a rap. Right, right. Everything we heard hip hop came on at midnight. Right. And it went off at one o'clock. Right, 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 right. So. First, we had to sneak into the pantry um, with the radio because we were supposed to be in bed. Right, right, right. And then we had to get our cassette recorder and record whatever hip hop we could get our hands on. Right. And then we had a, a, this is because I lived in a small town. I lived in San Antonio, so there wasn't much going on here. Right, right. But when we got a chance to get to Houston, it was a way different scene. You could, um, they used to sneak us downtown so we could watch the DJs battle in the radio station to see who was going to go upstairs. You know, so we got to, the the whole time we were there, we didn't get to see anything in Houston because we was right next to that radio hit record trying to right, right, record right, right. all the rap albums we could get our hands on. <laughs> right, right. Wow. <laughs> what about Florida? Yeah, I mean, our, our situation was similar. I mean, you know, you would hear it either. Well, the good thing about Orlando, we actually was like a melting pot. We had a lot of people that were from New York right. um, that came and lived here. Um, right. And so my experiences that I had were from the people that migrated from up north to Orlando and that stayed here that were going to school and things of that nature. All my friends are from up north. That's what influenced me as an artist. But uh, more importantly, we had relationships with like the college DJs who would play the music because they were like, like SP just said, they weren't playing it on the regular radio stations because you would hear Luke Skywalker, you hear some of the bass music. Um, Right, right. But as we became exposed to it, either through the friends that we had that would bring the music down or share the music with us or just the opportunity to hear it on college radio. And then eventually when Yo MTV Raps became a reality and different things like that, we were getting exposed to it. Um, but it was just just actually just trying to gravitate to whatever piece of hip hop you can get at that time and right. making use of it. And so it was a it was a challenging time, you know, as far as um, the exposure aspect, because it wasn't readily available to us in Florida as it was up north um, in the East Coast. But I mean, well, in New York, but yeah. we did have access to it because of the, for me, the relationships I had or whomever was playing the music, we would gravitate to that person support it because that was right. the only way we was getting it. You know, right. that's basically how we kept in, kept up with the music at that time. Right. Yeah. Wow. And it was hard. It was hard to. It was hard to. The getting Black Moon's album was oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. near impossible. Really? The here in San Antonio because the record the record stores didn't respect rap. So right, it, right, the right. rap section was like this about this big. Wow! Really? Yes. Yeah, <laughs> that's facts. Wow. The rap section, the rap section is minute. Even today, it's only like two or three rows because wow. they have country, and then they have Tejano, and then they have Zydeco. You know, because we're so close to Louisiana, and um, so it. The be- the best thing that ever happened to us was um, a guy came down from New York. We called him New York, 
and he'd bring <laughs> he'd bring cassettes. And really? boy, we was on him like white on rice. <laughs> Soon as he opened up that box, we would add. He sell out daily. <laughs> wow. I like hearing stories like this, man. Like when when um I you know, we before the music, like before me and my brother got into to music heavy, we still used to travel a lot because you know, I had an aunt that lived in LA and I had an aunt that lived in Vegas and we would go stay with her in the summertime and we would bring our hip hop out there just to see the vibe. We just, I never knew what records popped off or what songs were big and what songs, like hearing stories. I used to always think any record that popped in New York, it popped everywhere or any album that popped in New York. And yo, I had a, fr I have a friend who lives in Alabama. He's from New York. Okay. And I asked him, I said, hey, does uh, such and such work in Alabama? Like, does this record work in Alabama? He said, nope. I said, but this is like a New York classic over like a fat rat, Fonda Ray. I don't know if you guys know this record. So I'm thinking if it pops off in New York, it pops off all over. Uh, no, that doesn't work that way. Because he was like, they never even heard of that record out in Alabama. I said, what? So I'm, I'm shocked. So I always ask people, that's not from New York. Yo, what worked here? Like, I don't know. Never can maybe agree with me on this. In New York, Mays and Frankie Beverly are just regular people. They're just regular people. Their biggest record is going to be Before I Let Go and Enjoy in Pain, right? Mm -hmm. But when we step out of New York, especially going into the South, Mays, yeah. Frankie Beverly is a god. A yes. god. Yeah, he is. He is. In New York. <laughs> yeah, he is. In New York City, he is a regular guy. Hey, Frankie was yeah. a, he could walk the street, he'd be cool. In North Carolina, Frankie Beverly needs security on top of security. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's yeah. right. Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Anywhere in the South. Anywhere in the South, Frankie Beverly is he he is everything. And the, went, but right. also the blues artists. Yeah, they are. They are. Johnny Taylor to us is just as important right, as right. Frankie right. Bevel. Right, right. To right. us, Johnny Taylor is right. king. Right. Yeah. And you so, want, you want, yeah, but you want to hear something crazy? In my years at the record store, you know what my all-time, like, I'll have, like, top three all-time seller in my store was? What? Candy liquor, Marvin C. I Great could enough. not keep that record in the store. <laughs> <laughs> that, yo, I'm in Queens. This is in Queens. I'm For like, who's buying For this years. record? <laughs> yeah, see? Marvin, see? C's, Marvin C's is so well then. But has it ever been sampled? Remember, so no, I don't, I don't people, think it has been. So many people in New York migrated from the South. Right, exactly. right, exactly. right, right. Down here, Marvin Cease is, he, he's huge to oh, us. I, I could not keep that record in the store. Another another record I couldn't keep in the store, Stroking, Clarence oh, Carter. Yeah. Oh, man, now you're talking. I out the door. Now you're talking. <laughs> I mean, you can't. <laughs> Clarence Carter, Clarence Carter, Clarence Carter. You can't go to any <laughs> black family <laughs> reunion. <laughs> you cannot go to any black family reunion or any old school club. Right. right? right. In the South, especially, without hearing some <laughs> Clarence Carter, Carter stroking. I be stroking. I'm like, what? Oh, I'm my God. Like, what? <laughs> Every <laughs> Saturday, like Saturdays was always big days for us. Every, mm -hmm. yo, you got that stroking Clarence yeah. Carter? <laughs> oh, I want that. <laughs> like, Let me get two copies. <laughs> Let me get two. <laughs> yeah, you're right. You're right this about that Clarence fresh. Carter. For sure. <laughs> yeah, I didn't, you know what's so funny? I didn't hear that song until years later, until I became me a too. Soldier. Me too. And I was like, and you know, from from the south. And so when I heard, I was like, what is that? But I mean, when that when that song comes on, they get on the dance floor. Oh my god! Mm -hmm. Oh my like, god! You know, that's like you know, that's like a um, you know, a track that we hear from Black Moon or you know, a hip hop classic to us. Right. That's how it was to them. Oh, and so it was God. like, yo, I didn't even realize that, but I came hip to it because you're in music, you got to understand all types of, you know, <laughs> yeah, right, like. right. So, right, you know, it was like, yo, so it's funny you brought that up. Yeah, man. I remember sneaking down into the cellar to listen to that 
to listen to that record because we we weren't allowed to listen right. to it. So, but we would all crawl down in the cellar and get around that record player and we would listen to Clarence Carter. We listened to Dolomite, <laughs> Richard oh, Pryor, right. oh, you right. know, Red right. Fox. <laughs> right. So that in the South, that's a rite of passage to be able to sneak your parents' records down right. into the right. cellar. <laughs> yeah. Right. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, Mr. Wall, let me ask a quick question here. Um, yes, sir. You talked about a song that got you to become, you know, to get you into producing and making a right. career. But what was the first song you heard that made you fall in love with hip hop? Oh, wow. It made me fall in love with hip hop? I mean, I don't want to be cliche, but it was Rapper's Delight. When I first heard Rapper's Delight, I was. I was in the ninth grade when I first heard Rapper's Delight. No, I'm not. I'm bugging. I was in, I was nine years old when I heard yeah. Rapper's Delight. And I, I was in the fourth grade. Fourth grade. I was in yeah. the fourth grade. And it was just something different. I never heard nothing like it before. I was the type of guy that when I'm listening to radio and they would play Chic Good Times, I would pray mm -hmm. that it would be the 12-inch version or the version with the break on there. And if it's the 45 version where it goes into the little whack break, I'm like, oh, like if you play the break mm -hmm. on primetime radio, I'm excited as a little kid. So I'm hearing Raps of Delight. And, and then we had a station out here, uh, KTU 92. They would play the whole version, the 15 minute version. So I'm excited. So when I first heard that record on regular radio, I was like, yo, I don't know what this is, but this is great. Because then right after that came the breaks, Curtis Blow and Grandmaster Flash was super rapping. And it was just different hip hop records were just coming out. And when a record came out, it was an event. So all the places that you've been, mm -hmm. that you've traveled in the world, right? what's your favorite? And also, which one which place haven't you been that you always wanted to go? All right, I'm going to start with the latter one, and you're going to think that I'm crazy. You know what? A place that I, I've been everywhere in Texas except for Houston. I want to go to Houston, Texas so okay. bad. That would be dope. Houston's dope. <laughs> I've, been, <laughs> I've been to Dallas. I ate at Grandy's in Dallas, Texas. I've been to, to Austin. I've been to San Antonio. I've never been to Houston. Tell them about the. Have you had? Did you have the cinnamon roll? No, I had the biscuits. Sweet mother of Jesus. <laughs> oh, God. So good. Good <laughs> God, yo. Grandy biscuits? biscuits. Oh my God. Oh my God. You oh have to try God. the cinnamon roll. I didn't try that yet. Uh -huh. <laughs> no, Listen, no. I got diabetes. I don't want that shit to get worse. <laughs> now we don't want that to happen. We need you to we need you yeah. for a long time, Mr. Walt. We're going oh, yeah. to uh, no well being and you. health. Health is going to be some of our next episodes. Health and well being. You're going to tune in. Okay, yeah, that's de definitely, Mr. Walt. And and Man, SP, we, you got you got to send me some of those biscuits. Then you have to go to. This is it. Is okay. Gran Wait, is Granny still open? Yes. Oh my God! Did you hear my what she said, jumped. Mr. Walt? Huh? She, she just gave you a spot to go to, Mr. Walt. Yes, Tell him again, did. SP. Tell him the spot so you can write it when down. You go, when you go to Houston, go to This Is It. Hold on, hold on. Hold on now. Shit, we black people. We got to make sure we, we look out for each other. Oh, no doubt. <laughs> this is in the green book. This is in the green book. That is in the green book. That's true. <laughs> this is it, Dr. right? It's in, the green book. It's, in the, it's in the green book, really? <laughs> you remember the restaurant on Jason's Lyric? Right, yeah. That's this is it. Okay. Wow, this is it. That's where I want to be, right there. Don't get too close <laughs> you know it. Might you know I'm from shot. the south, so you know I like it <laughs> all day long. Yo, do me a favor. When y'all do a show about the re best restaurants in each city, please include me in this show. All right, no problem. We'll be glad to have you back on. We'll be glad to have you back on for sure. I would. I'll tell you where to eat in different cities. All right, oh, that'd yeah. be dope. We need we to do, do one need like to do a show about like hip hop artists that are like it, like a foodies. Either they cook or they just know about a lot. Oh, that's no, that's awesome. I didn't even think about that. We could call oh, it the hip hop green book. This, this, this is when I knew it was yes, different. Yes. This uh, is when I knew it was different. 
Okay. I go to New Orleans in 96. We go to the Popeyes down there. That shit is carte blanche down there. Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Don't I'm dare. talking about, yeah. you thought you was eating French cuisine up in there. <laughs> oh, like, oh, yeah. No the more, and the more hood, the more hood the spot, too. The oh, better. Yeah. No, but yeah, closer exactly. to the hood, the Popeyes is just, mm. Oh, my. There's a spot. There was a spot that I How did that this combo go up here? on in Atlanta called Be- the Beautiful. I don't know if it's still open mm-hmm. in Atlanta. Oh, my God. Incredible, man. Incredible mm-hmm. spot. Yo, we we yo, we're gonna get sponsorship. Thanks a lot, uh, Mr. No I appreciate yeah. that. <laughs> Can I ask a question? Um, how has the boom bap sound changed over time to you? And how do you think it's remained the same in your opinion? Like what are the similarities and differences in the boom bap sound to you as one of the original? I'm gonna tell you one thing. There's there's less uh, there's less bottom mm-hmm. in the boom bap sound because a lot of the producers they're younger and they didn't come up in the analog era. In the analog era, bottom was very important to us. Where, but being now that everyone everything is digital and everybody listens to music differently, it's kind of less boom. It's kind of less bottom on it. We never ever faded away from that. We stuck. We we stuck with it because of who we are and and our um, what we we did in the past. But a lot of people fell back from the bottom. But the boom bap is still there. I mean, you could still hear it on certain records. And stuff like the onion, like the trap stuff and the drill stuff that the kids are listening to. I mean, it's cool, but you you gotta go back to the boom bap because that's traditional hip hop. You know what I'm saying? That's traditional hip hop right there. Yeah. And- you know what I'm saying? Like mm-hmm. Rick Ross, every once in a while, will hit you with a banger like that. Mm-hmm. Like, mm-hmm. I understand you have to stay relevant with what's going on, and I get that. But every once in a while, Rick Ross will hit you with a joint. You go, wow, oh, mm-hmm. wow, what's going on here? You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. And stuff mm-hmm. like that. So, yeah. First time I heard Big Meech right. was in, um, what's that club in Atlanta? Damn, now I'm really going to incriminate myself. What was that club? Magic City. I right. Was Magic City, you know, having fun. And I heard Big Meech play five times in a row. They were breaking the record. I had not heard bass like that in a Incredible, minute. I don't right? remember what year that was. That was 2010. Um, 2010, 2010, 2010, summer. 2010 right. man, I had not heard right. I was like, what type of song is this? It's just <laughs> rattling the whole club. Mm-hmm. And I'm sitting there like, whoa. I was like, did you just knew when you heard a hit? I was like, I didn't think boom bap or anything like that, but all I thought was bass. I had right, not heard right, a bass right, line like that. Right. Then they played the remix with um what's the Styles P. Styles I was P like, on oh, I'm done. Right, so that's right. so wow. That's that's you know, Mr. What was that not to like stereotype, but for some reason I would never think of you saying, you know, Rick Ross in that type of sentence. So mm-hmm. salute well, to that. I something. respect let me, that. I respect let me tell you, that. The other day I posted on Instagram, right? Mm-hmm. I posted, yo, shout out to Rick Ross. He's one of the best beat pickers in this game, mm-hmm. right? Like Harry. Yeah, he is. He so that man track. knows how to fucking pick beats. Yeah, he does. Like, he's good. incredible. Mm-hmm. And, and, and people would give me so much like flack for that. I'm They're like, like, you, Mr. Wolf? You? Right. Ah. I was like, no, y'all gotta listen to that man's production. Yo, his production is <laughs> always bananas. been tight. Always yeah. been tight. From day he one. He knows how to pick a beat. Yeah. Talk about the most improvement for an MC. I'm not saying right. he was whack from when he came out, but that progression, he's evolved Ooh. like two or three times over. Yes, yeah. I said it, and I support this message. Boom! Hey, and I'm and I'm All rocking right. with you, brother. I'm rocking with you. And I'm, and I and I triple <laughs> and I and I, I stand on it too. I put my stamp on it. Yeah, oh, Rack, you from Florida. You knew you had to put the stamp on well, you know, I got it. Or else you can't walk the hey, Florida streets. I'll, I'll, you got to put them stamp on I'll put a stamp on everybody, but I'll put it on Rick, though. I'll put it on Rick. Got to. You I'll got put it on to. Rick. He, he, Shout he out, out to problem. Little Haiti. Shoot. Yeah, I'm yeah. Little Haiti. Salute. So no doubt. No doubt. I want so Rack to be good in the Florida streets. Right, right, right. Right. I'm good no matter what, but I feel you, though. I appreciate the love, though. <laughs> <laughs> For real. But yeah, you got to show the love. To, you got to get love when love is when love is um wanted. You know what I'm saying? Right, but right. You got to give these love. people that credit. I, you know what I'm saying? I, I think so, what are some of the new <laughs> new producers that you love? Um, yeah, you put them on the spot. Oh. Um, I like, I like. I, I mean, Knox is one of my favorite favorite all time guys. Like so that guy's incredible. 
um, Jake One, but these guys are really not really new because they've been around for a minute. Mm -hmm. Jake One, not um, Crisis. Okay. Um, uh, Apollo, Apollo Brown. Oh, yeah. He um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a bunch of them. You know what I'm saying? I mean, um, I, I, I see what he, Hit Boy is doing, and I get it. See, Hit Boy, he understands the boom bap. Like, he, because you mm -hmm. can hear it creeping in his records. He'll go and make a, a, a you know, a, a record for 2022. He'll make that record, but he'll give you a, a boom bap thing. And I'm see, I see what he's doing, and I'm not mad at it. I, I, I mean, I'm not particularly a fan of his mixes. But his, his his production, his production, you see it happening. Like, you see where he's going, and that's dope. Yeah, it is dope. And, and, and I, for some reason, I don't know why, but people don't get hear that underlying boom bap underneath uh, even his trap beats. Right. Have an you underlying hear it. boom bap feel. You're right, Asri. You know why? Because I hear it in his songs. Even in his trap shit, I'll hear a boom bap like a vibe from it. And I'm like, okay, this I see where he's going. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? I like I like Hit Boy. I just like I said, I don't like the mixes on his records. I'm not particularly a fan of. Mm -hmm. But mm -hmm. his production, I like it. Yeah. So, it, what's one of your dream collaborations with the artist, or even um, that you haven't worked with yet? I still haven't worked with Redman. I still want to work with Redman. Okay. Like that's. A, a dream thing, you know what I'm saying? Working mm -hmm. with Redman, like um, I'm a gigantic Redman fan, so you know. But I've learned, like one thing about me is I'm, I'm patient because last year we did a record with Nas, and I haven't, you know, I've been mm -hmm. trying to work with Nas for years. Like we were supposed to do the album that Kanye did. We were supposed okay. to do that. Album. Okay, you know what I'm saying so. Working with Nas and and I always wanted to work with Styles P and and Ghostface. It it all happened on one record, so I was real happy about that. That was the record from for the forty year old version. Um, I'm just I, I I'm thinking about Red Man at this moment because from the moment I saw his MTV cribs, the best I one. Just, I just want to sit in the corner while you <laughs> make this record with him. <laughs> that was the best in MTV that house. I just think 1200 was... at that house. Right, right, right. right. That'll be, I that'll think be a, quite a show. The, the most fun. It was the best one. It was the best MTV career of all time. Are we going to Uber Eats them biscuits you were talking about? Whatever y'all talking about, we're going to Uber Eats them. Well, that's what we're talking about biscuits. you right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're gonna over eat you gonna over eat Grandy's biscuits? Definitely. Wow. I'm saying for that, <laughs> I'm saying Mr. Wall, I'm saying for that type of session, we gotta get right. those flown right, in right. on the yeah. private jet with like Oprah right, or right. whatever and have the right food and the right, you know. The best sets. that we can do, the best that we can do in New York now, mm -hmm. we gotta hit up red lobster for their biscuits, and that's yeah, the that's closest true. you're gonna get to Granny's biscuits <laughs> until you go to Dallas. Wow. <laughs> Damn. Damn. That's well, they, they, now you know. You heard it from Mr. Walker. Yeah. <laughs> That's what, as my grandmother used to say, it'll make your tongue beat your brains out. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, I do have a question to ask you as far as um, career choice. Right. Now, we, you know, if you were not a music producer, what would be some other interests or careers you would like to explore? Something in sports, like. Okay. Because. I'm a big sports head and, and stuff like that. So something sports announcer or something, I don't know, but something mm -hmm. dealing with sports, but okay. music was always, music was always like my, my uh, choice because of, uh, I'm, I remember when I was young, I was like, I want to be a doctor. Cause my mother was, a, was like, uh, mm -hmm. she was a nurse. So I was like, I want to be a doctor. But I say, like, Hey man, I can't go to more school. I ain't going to go to school. <laughs> <laughs> So, I, music, like, my mother played a keyboard and my father played in a band. And my father used to always come home with records and stuff like that. So, that just made me want to do this. 
You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? But like I said, when just the PE record just took it over the top for me. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, took it over the top. Are they um and since you talked about PE, what a, are they one of your as far as production, are they and talk part of your top five favorite producers of all time or Bomb Squad is number one. Okay. I mean, well, no, my favorite producer is Pete Rock, but then Bomb Squad is number two. They will be number mm -hmm. two. Okay. Your top five is what's your top five? Any order, top five of all time for you. Pete, Bomb Squad, Premier, um, um, DJ Quick. Okay. Um, and not. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Just said one of SP's favorite producers. In there. <laughs> I'll let you. I'll let you decide who it is. Um, Quick. Boom! Look at that. <laughs> who for right. Mr. Walt? Yo, the only reason good. why because we didn't talk about Quick all day. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Quick, not Quick he is my favorite, he's one of my favorite producers. Oh my god, that guy's incredible, man. Yo, he's I don't yo, I don't know what's going on in that man's head, but he's incredible. And the instrumentation, you right. know, I it, it's quick is special, and I don't think he gets the credit he deserves. No, he, no, he, no, don't. he don't he don't. He don't. You know why? Because because Dre owns um California. That's true. Dre owns California, like. It's mm -hmm. people like Quick and Battle Cat that like they're not talking about. You need to talk about those two. Those yeah. two. Oh my God, Battle Cat. You Battle know, Cat, he, dope too. And he's mm -hmm. one of the nicest guys you'll ever meet in your life. He wow. is just so such a nice guy. Such a nice guy, man. And what I always like like about Quick, it doesn't matter uh, what year, right? You listen to Quick. Quick is still Quick. Still quick, right? Still quick. Same yeah. Timeless. Yeah, timeless. He's timeless. Yeah, he's timeless. Right. He's timeless. So let me ask. Uh, I think you said it earlier, but Mr. Walt, do you think that the beat miners get the respect and recognition they deserve? And do you think Black Moon or Boot Camp Click as a collective get the props and recognition they deserve in helping to create and promote the original boot yeah. rap sound? Um, beat miner wise. The right people always like gives us props, and those are the ones that makes me happy. You know what I'm saying? Like I'm happy with the love that we get, especially like on social media and stuff like that. I feel boot camp should get more credit and more of the props that they that they don't get. That that's what I'm more. I'm more for boot camp getting it than beat miners getting it. We we get it because of who we are and and the way we carry ourselves. But boot camp should always, he, they should get more credit than what they do, than what they get. Yeah. Yeah, they should. So when it's yeah. all said and done, what do you, what do you want to be remembered for? What, what, what's your legacy? What do you want your legacy to be? Always. Not just, not just in music, but just in life. I um, me just being a straight up guy telling it like it is and not, you know, holding, like telling you the truth. Like my brother, if my brother, I call him the mayor. Evil D is the mayor because everyone loves Evil D. Everybody wants to hug the big teddy bear. Oh, hey, Evil D. <laughs> right? <laughs> but Mr. Ward, everybody calls me the mean brother because I'm the one that I'll tell you to, to tell, I, my brother will tell you shit because Maybe you want to hear it. Hey, yeah, sure, I'll do it. Uh, yeah, whatever. What is the one that goes, uh, I don't think that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I'm yeah. the straightforward guy. Like, nah, that's not happening. Or, okay, yeah, we could do it. Or whatever, whatever and stuff like that. So I'm, you know, I'm the, I'm the straightforward guy. But what, when I have an opinion on something, always know that it comes from the heart. You know what I'm saying? So just to be, people to see me as a straightforward person. That's all. So, since the name of the show is Powerful Impact, right? who are the three most influential people in your life that had a powerful impact? Oh, wow. Um, um, is it either personally or professionally? Either or. Um, personally, it's my mom, because 
she raised me and my brother and uh, my little baby sister by herself. You know, dad left when, you know, we were young and she mm -hmm. held it down and she made me look at this life different, you know, by mm -hmm. doing that. Like, you know, like she was like, you know what? I'm not going to sit here and cry. I'm going to, I'm just going to pull my big, my big fucking woman pants up or whatever. And mm -hmm. I'm going to run this household like it's supposed to be. And she did it. Mm -hmm. Like when, she, when it, when, when it had to come down to something, she said, you know what? I can't sit here and cry about it. I'm going to go ahead and do it. So mm -hmm. my mother's a big influence in my life. Um, professionally, like I said, you know, it was the bomb squad. They changed my whole life. Mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. As far as for me doing what I wanted to do, the bomb squad and public enemy, it was just whatever, um, whatever they did that changed my life and it made me open my eyes to what I wanted to do. So, and man, um, I don't know. I just have to think about the third one. <laughs> that's understandable. It yeah, could be somebody like, miscellaneous. Yeah, it could be a um, professional person already. It's my miscellaneous. Um, wow. Uh, I always get stuck on questions like this. Um, Let's play Mr. Walt with serious over here, Mr. Walt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yes. We talk about biscuits and then we talk about inspiration. Okay. <laughs> and I've been stroking. Yeah, well, exactly. We had to bring this Kurt, is giving me in. inspiration. I have to tell you. <laughs> <laughs> hey, whatever works for you. That's how I see it. Um, I don't know. Uh, I, I, you know what? My brother, my brother gives me inspiration because right now it's just me and him, and my brother stayed on the ground with 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 what he do as far as with DJing and just making mm -hmm. it happen. It's just him, and that inspires me to to make it to to do what I got to do and to make it happen. Because even during the pandemic, Evil was trying to figure out. How what's the next move? And he, he figured it out. Even when, like, outside of boot camp, he had he was like, "Yo, I had to make a name for myself as a DJ. Mm -hmm. Like, I can't rely mm -hmm. on Black Moon or boot camp for shows. I got to make my own show." So he started going on the road. He was going hard with his mixtapes and blah blah blah. And he just kept driving and kept doing it and. He got on Hot 97. He was on Hot 97 for a few years. And he mm -hmm. just, yo, he, he just kept going. So he inspired me too. Okay. Yeah. So just wanted to know, was there anybody you wanted to shout out or are you promoting anything right now? Well, uh, I just want to shout out all all the powerful impact listeners and and you. you know who know who the beat miners are and who love the beat miners. Thank you for the support. Um, be on the lookout for our new album, me and Evil's new album. It's going to come out probably springtime or summertime. We're we're locking the deal in now, but it's going to come out spring or summer. And the name of the album is called Stifle Creativity. Dope. So mm -hmm. it shows that we're taking it. We, we always stay true to the boom back. So basically that's what you're going to get. And, you know, in this day and age, boom back is stifled creativity. Absolutely. So we just, we, we took it back to that. And, you know, me and Evil, we also have our own radio station, Beat Miners Radio. Um, you could uh, download that um, from the iTunes store, the app, uh, Beat Miners Radio. And then also we're, um, we, we're, we're, you can catch us on the web, on our website, BeatMindedRadio.com and okay. um, wow, we're doing and we you know we got a whole bunch of new stuff coming out and we're just staying working. We're just working. Okay. Yeah. Well, I got two questions. First yeah, of all, are. the first question I want to ask is if someone wanted to reach out to you uh, for production, I'm just thinking about our audience because we do have artists that tune in, cool. and I'm sure they're going to want to know how to contact you because you're a legendary producer. How would they go about doing that? And then I asked the second question after you asked the first one. You could contact me on all on my social media platform. Okay. Uh, on Instagram at Twitter, it's at Beatminers, B-E-A-T-M-I-N-E-R-Z. Okay. Um, 
Facebook, um, uh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Facebook is a no. Right, Sorry, Facebook. Uh, I, I'm not really a Facebook person because they they yeah. just get crossed the line with me all the goddamn time. So I yeah. mostly promote Instagram, which is the same company, but okay. I promote Instagram and, and Twitter. Okay. Yeah, that works. That works. I don't like Facebook neither, so I'm in the I'm yeah. In the like Facebook is there. Come on. Yeah, and the last one I have, since this is about you, and you did mention it earlier, I just wanted to give you a chance to expound on it. How did you get the name, Mister Walt? I just want to make sure we ended on that, so people can just focus on how you became who you are, <laughs> which you touched on a little bit throughout the show. On the on the album Low and Fury, Tribe Called Quest. Okay. Um, there's a song called What. Okay. Q Tip. Said in the line, uh, what's Music Factory without Mr. Walt? Music Factory mm -hmm. was a record store I worked at in Jamaica, okay. Queens. Okay. Um, and that's where I met Tip and we became real close friends okay. um, through that record store. And he was basically just giving me my props. And I didn't have a name. I I was like, what should my name my, my name be? Walter Dugard or blah blah blah. Like I always <laughs> I always had a problem finding a name. And then he just said, yo, what's Music Factory without Mr. Wall? And mm -hmm. when he said it, it just stuck. And I just went with it. And plus, you know, Mr. You command respect with, when you put Mr. in front of your name. So Very true. I just was like, yo, this is perfect. And I just ran with it. Yo, you, oh, sorry. Finish so right. Sorry. Well, I was going to say that you're right. And, you know, when you do put Mr. before your name, it is a, a respect. Right. But we... We here at Powerful Impact, we respect you, and there Thank are many you. others who respect what you've done and the contribution you made to hip hop and the things you will continue to do, the things that are in motion right now. Uh, we definitely respect you, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna give Neb the opportunity to go ahead and ask this question, but I want to let you know that we respect what you, you Thank do, you so much. and I'm sure your fan base agrees with us on that Thank as well. You. Mm -hmm. it, it's just it's mind blowing now. I always put the emoji with the boom. I always thought that line, Mr. Walt, was about CNC Music Factory. Whoa. And I thought Walt was some producer that is craziness. So, so I'm reading your name now and I'm getting Walter, Mr. Walt. I'm like, duh. And then seeing, and I always thought, what's music? So I'm always, I always remember Music Factory was big around that time. Right. So I thought it was one of the producers or something. I used to be like, why is Q-Tip shouting out these CNC Music Factory? Wow. wow. Now now this is know. before you produce, this is before you even in the music business, right. shouting you out on a record. Right. And then that's 91. And then two years later, you guys drop. That right, is amazing. Right, right, right. Wow. It's like he spoke it into existence. Like I met at that record store. That record store was my favorite job out of all my jobs. Mm -hmm. Because at that record store, I met so many people at that store and so many there's so many stuff that happened in that store that I got to write a book about. Like, just when you would hear your favorite rap stars and what they did in that store, you'd be like, what? No way. No. <laughs> so that and, record store had a powerful impact on yeah, you. Right did. place, right because, time. Mm -hmm. Right. Because, yo, I met LL in there. The first time I met LL, I walked, I was so starstruck. I walked up to him. I was cutting open a box, right? Mm -hmm. And I still had the damn blade in my hand. And I walked up to him to shake his hand with the blade there. And I was like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I said, ooh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Cats don't play. Them Brooklyn dudes ain't playing yeah. around. They greet you yeah, with a like, Yo, like, 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 it was like every day somebody new would come in there. or, or mm -hmm. and, and I just met everybody in that, stu in that spot. And I just established relationships with them. So when I got into the industry, like as an artist, I it was like I already had relationships with these people. Like, hey, what's up? Ba 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 ba. Oh, you here now? Oh, okay. Ba ba ba. You know, and and stuff like that. But yo, that store, I love that store, man. That store was really a great store. And then you go from selling records to become a record digger, <laughs> yes. which I find very interesting. That's, and, whole, and really, that's for the next episode right and it, oh, yeah. but that store helped me also with understanding music because when i went in there i was just like hip-hop and like r&b but then like i said i didn't know nothing about marvin seats until i got to that store and then i'm just like why is this record flying off the the the, the shelves like that flew off the shelves Rising to the top, Kenny Burke flew off the mm -hmm. shelves. 
um, yo, it, was, it just opened my mind to different music. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, I just, it just helped me as, and, it, and it molded me into the producer and the DJ I am today. That's dope. I mean, your, your life experience. And we thank you for star- sharing your story with us today. And you heard it here first on Powerful Impact that Mr. Walt met LL Cool J with a box cutter. So a we box to, cutter. We want to. Yeah. <laughs> I feel so. I felt like shit that day. I was like, oh my god. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm thinking that record store is where they filmed "I Need Love." Um, what's the other one? Ain't no joke. It feels like that was mm-hmm. the record store. No, 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 no. Of. Matter of fact, none of those record store, not, none of those videos were filmed there. Okay. Huh, um, like that was I ain't no joke. I think was filmed on Pitkin Avenue. Okay. Yeah, but they it looks like it looks like Jamaica Avenue, but it wasn't. It wasn't. Mm-hmm. It wasn't Jamaica Ave. Okay. Like we would do in stores in that store. Like mm-hmm. I remember we did an in store where Ice T and Big Daddy came. What? Mm. Jamaica Avenue was so off the hook. Same day? It was because they was on tour together. That's ridiculous. Yo, wow. the security, we, we, yo, we had, we let three people in and then we had to shut it down because this that's like how 80, bad it was on Jamaica Avenue. This is 88, 89. This was 88. Wow. This was 88. Big Daddy Kane was at the height of his, I know. No one really came here for Ice T, so Ice T felt some type of way about that. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I bet he yeah. did. Some type of way about that. So, um, um, yo, it was Jamaica Avenue was so crazy. We let three girls in, so Kane could sign their autographs, and then we had to sneak Kane and Ice T out through the bottom of the. Um, we had to take them downstairs in the basement, and like shuffle them down to the end of the block. And then there was a, um, a what was those things called? Those, the basement. We had to mm-hmm. open that basement door and yeah, the, the car was waiting yeah, for the them breaks. on the corner. That's right. craziness. Wow. Yeah, yeah, it was going to be a riot or stampede. Yo, it they was felt, crazy. They felt it was going to get out of control. Yeah, so they, they oh, we only gosh. let three people in and it was like, yo, shut it down. And we had to shut it down. That was the biggest in-store we ever had. Oh wow! Yeah, cause cause LL everybody saw LL because he's from Queens, so LL mm-hmm. will always be on Jamaica Avenue. You know what I'm saying? But when Kane came, it was an event. Like, oh, Big Daddy came, blah blah blah, this and that. But in that record store, I met so many people. I met Scott LaRock like the week before he passed away. No, he man. came to the record store. Um, so when so I was in fan status then. So I was like. Wow, you're in Queens. You guys made a record called South Bronx and you're in Queens buying records? Wow, you're a gangster. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's true. At that moment, yeah, you're right. Right, like, wow, why are you here? Sh- yo, Shan might come and get you. You need to get out of here. You know, Word. But, no minded. Right, right, right. But yeah, like it was um. It was different, man. It was it was different, but I just loved that job. Yo, I met good people from that job. You know, that's not even in the business. It's good people that lifelong friends with me, and I'm still talk to this day. That is so dope. Yeah, yeah. it is. I well, remember mm-hmm. Jerobi and Fight used to always come in there every day. That's how I, I met them there too. And yo, one thing about me, I used to always, if, if it was dope, I used to like it. Yo, I love, I love Busta Move, um, Young MC, mm-hmm. right? And, and Jerome used to look at me like, yo, what's wrong with you? I said, you don't like this record? This record is dope, right? And then <laughs> when he found out that I, that I was like, yo, mm-hmm. this please don't, please hammer, don't hurt them album, this shit is good. They mm-hmm. was like, yo, what, you are bugging right now. Like, you really yeah. like this? I said, yeah, it's not whack. It's okay. <laughs> yeah, you lose but love back then. Time for that. Yeah, you lose love back then for like right. the Hammer record. <laughs> <laughs> Anything that was like Hammer or uh, um, Young MC, yeah, you lose some love. But right Hammer there. was never whack, though. Yeah. Hammer was, he just wasn't, he wasn't the New York cup of tea. You, yeah. you understand? Like, all right. Yeah, this is Listen. another shocking Mr. Walt moment. Right, but, but, I, but I'm going to be real. Nev, I'm going to be real with it. Check this out. And Nev, you could back me up on this if you want. Me and Nev, we're from New York. Mm -hmm. When it came down to to hip-hop, New Yorkers were very close-minded. 
Mm-hmm. We didn't mm-hmm. rock with anybody else outside of New York. Mm-hmm. So Shy D and Luke and Two Live mm-hmm. Crew and them, they wasn't getting love from That's us. True. You know what That's I'm right. saying? Right. Um, mm-hmm. Whoever else wasn't getting love. Uh, Arabian Prince from L.A. and mm-hmm. J- Rodney O and, and Joe Cooley, they wasn't getting Chips love. Because we're looking at them, they didn't look like us. So we're already alienating them. Oh, we're not fucking with y'all, blah, 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 right? Mm-hmm. If it wasn't for, and I mean, if it wasn't for Yo MTV Raps, mm-hmm. we because all we had was video music box. That's true. Mm-hmm. You're right. We did not open, we weren't open to Yo MTV Raps. We, we wouldn't know who outside of New York, who they were. The only reason why we let Jazzy Jeff and Fresh Prince in the door and Steady B in the door because they sounded like New York. That's true. That's and true. we didn't know where they were from. So we assumed they were from New York. You understand what I'm saying? Like, mm-hmm. no one they was, had that look too. They had that look. Huh? The they had that look too in the videos. They right. They had because they were Philly. And, yeah. Yeah. Philly's like, Philly's like right underneath us. So we That's accepted true. them. Mm-hmm. Right. But your MTV raps is the reason why we accepted NWA and Ice Cube and we accepted uh, Two Live Crew. And we accepted, uh, you know, all these DLC and all that. We, because mm-hmm. of your MTV raps, it opened our mind to uh, outside hip hop. If it wasn't for your MTV raps, we would not even give them no love. And the crazy shit too was Ed Lover used to always come to our stores. Him and Dr. Mm-hmm. Dre. Mm-hmm. Ed Lover used to be a security guard in Andrew Jackson High School, mm-hmm. and he used to call him Cheese Boy. <laughs> Ooh, Dr. Dre, right? Dr. Dre. Oh, at Lover. At Lover. Oh, yeah, oh he was a gosh. security guard in, in Andrew Jackson. That's hilarious. That's the school that LL went to. Mm-hmm. That's hilarious. Wow. Yeah. He and yo, they got the job. Like he was he was a big househead too. So he wasn't really even feeling hip hop. Mm-hmm. He got that job. He changed the game. I mean, they was already making noise with Fat Pot Freddy, but when Ed Lover and Dr. Dre got on, yeah, it was, was a whole different thing. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, you know, but Young TV Rap is the reason why New York became open minded to outside people. Yeah. I never thought of that. I never thought of it. Yeah. Like we were right. close. Yo, yeah. New York. I, I'm coming up under that. Yeah. That makes we, sense. That makes yo, sense. New York. It gave a people, visual. Right. We were so close minded. Like, if you wasn't from yeah, New York, right. I'm not showing you no love at well, all. I, well, I'm, I, I can speak to that because being in Florida, you know, back in the early, well, late 80s or early 90s, we couldn't get no love, you know. We put music out. It's like you from Florida. We ain't trying to hear that, you know what yep. I'm saying? And that's what we were experiencing. And it was like, you know, we felt like either we had to sound like New York or we had right. to be from New York. Right. And that's why a lot of guys that came from Florida, right. they wouldn't say they were from Florida. They'll say they're from New York or they say right. they're from somewhere else because they knew they wouldn't get any love unless it was somebody that was from um, New York that endorsed them, right? Or they pretended they were from up north, and I mean from New York in order to get the love. So I can. And that's one thing that I hated about my. Yeah. That's one thing I hated about where I was from. Like we were so close minded with that. Like we didn't give anybody else a chance. Mm-hmm. Like there's some dope people outside of New York. Mm-hmm. We needed someone to open our mind to be like, "Yo, hey, these guys from Compton, you need to listen to them mm-hmm. and stuff like that." Like, yo, my man Everett, who I was I said earlier. Mm-hmm. That he was the one who's who said, "Yo, you have to hear N.W.A. These mm-hmm. guys are next level," and I was like, "Really?" And I listened to that album, and I was like, "Yo, this this is something different." Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? So, you know, we didn't even get like like the Ghetto Boys yet. You know what I'm saying? Because because truth be told, you know where Bushwick Bill got his name from, right? He's from Brooklyn. Yeah. Bushwick Bill is in my second grade class. Oh, oh my gosh. Word. <laughs> yeah, small world. Damn. Bushwick Grill. We didn't call him Bushwick Bill. His name was Little Richie. Mm-hmm. Wow. Right? His name was Little Richie. He he because he looked like his he looked like his brother Richie. But he was like the first small person we ever met. I see. I, I can't say the other word. But he was the first yeah, small person to. I ever met in my life. And we were in second grade. Like I've never seen that before. So I'm looking at him like, yo, what's going on with this dude? Like, why is this dude mm-hmm. so angry? Like this dude used to take rocks and put it into snow like when it would snow he would put it in the snow and throw it at people like yo why is he so angry i just saw the wizard of oz everybody's so happy this guy's upset what's going on <laughs> bushwick was a terror from the public yeah school yo, he era. was bushwick yeah. bill was the yo I'm black a terror era. From we called him little richie era. his wow. name was little richie 
Yeah. SP, you, you didn't expect that in this interview, right? You oh, didn't no, think you that didn't he, they went to, that at all. You didn't think that he was uh, that he knew uh, Lil Bush with Bill. Bush was in I, my I, second grade class. I'm pretty Miss- sure somebody knew him because um, he had, Amazing. I think the beauty of being in Texas is uh, we didn't have any kind of bias. Right. So we listened to everything. Right. And when Texas finally found their found their way, found right, their sound, right, right, right. Um, right. they didn't try to be New York, and right. they didn't. They were unapologetically southern. Exactly, they were. Exactly. But because hey, look, I'm from. We're from Bushwick, Bushwick, Brooklyn. Mm-hmm. So when he moved to Houston. They were like, you know, where you from? Bushwick? Oh, we're going to call you Bushwick Bill. Mm-hmm. His real name is William, but we always call him Little Richie. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, you know. And all that angry shit he was doing that in second grade. So, you know. <laughs> so, so, so he when, was like, keeping it real. So when y'all blew up, Mr. Walton, you start, like, I guess, torn or whatever, and you see him again. It's like, what is the, Do you see him again, like, after he gets big? Like, yo, what up, Little Richie? Do you yeah, see like him I again? Him- we were supposed to have, I saw him um, in San Francisco one year and and he he didn't remember me and stuff like that. I was like, yo, dude, we was in Miss Turner's class. It was Miss Turner and Miss Barnett. Like, we, he remembered mm-hmm. the teachers, but he didn't remember any of the kids was in the class. But it was cool, though. You know, it was cool. Mm-hmm. Once you and call then, somebody by their nickname, though. They yeah, but remember. when I called him Little Richie, he knew that I knew. Yeah. Right, he knew it. Yeah. 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 When I first met Bush, when I first met Bushwick Bill, it was at a convenience store. Really? And I asked him for a, I was about 18 and I asked him for an autograph and he, he literally pulled out a piece of paper, but inside of his pants was this big, was a sawed off shotgun. Really? That was stuff down the side. <laughs> oh my wow. gosh! So he upgraded wow. from um snow. He upgraded from rocks and snow to shot. <laughs> wow! <laughs> Boom! Which was hilarious to me. I don't know why it was so funny, but as soon as he opened up that jacket, it just tickled me to death. And he had this <laughs> big old long gun stuck down his pants. <laughs> <laughs> was he in a rough part? Was this a rough area? Where he fifth was? Ward. He was in the Fifth Ward, right? Yeah. yeah. Fifth Ward is Fifth Ward. Fifth Ward is the wow. Fifth Ward. Wow. But you know, in Texas, you could you could walk, you could drive around with your shotgun like right next to you in your car. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's Texas different. is different. Rest in peace. Rest in peace. It's different Bush out there. Yeah, it's Special different. Dude. Rest in Special peace, Bushwickville. Rest, yeah, rest in peace. Yeah, rest in peace. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Well, we, you know, uh, again, Mr. Walt, you know, we can never say it in words how grateful we are for you Thank to come you. here Thank today you for having me. and spend time with us and tell us your story, tell us the experience you had and, and continue to have um, as far as being, you know, part of the beat miners and the production aspect, learning how your thought process when it comes to creating music, because right. most of the time when you see shows, you don't really see a producer on there who can break it down or at least give you an idea of what and encourage them. We're here, possibly a DJ, we're here about an MC, but it's, we're fortunate to have a producer to come on today. And not only are you, you're not just, you're an extraordinary producer. You're not just like an ordinary producer. You've done some, some magnificent things for the hip hop culture. And Thank so we're so just much. so grateful that you came here today. And we appreciate everybody, everybody for tuning in to Powerful Impact Podcast with Solrak, SP and Neb. And again, we, we featured the, the legendary producer, Mr. Walk from the Beat Miners. We encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel to stay connected to upcoming episodes and follow us on social media. And the reason I say do that, because we talked about some things that were unexpected. We talked about Bushwick Bill and so many different things that you wouldn't <laughs> expect from a Mr. Walt interview. So you got to subscribe so you can continue <laughs> knowing about these unexpected things that happen in our interviews. And more importantly, like we said before, follow us on social media. Remember, powerful impact is more than music. It's a way of life. Boom.